Tyler's fault. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and take a look at our bell work today. We're going to make sure we're comfortable, find the area of an irregularly shaped region bounded by the given curves, and also the volume, right? The volume of a solid of revolution in this case. And so firstly, we need to consider the graph. And so if we look at y equals 4 minus x squared, I know that's a parabola, right? Same steepness as my parent function, but opens upside down with the vertex of 0, 4. y equals x is our identity function, just our line with positive slope up 1 over 1, goes to the origin. And x equals 0 is the y-axis. And so let's go ahead and get a picture and see what that looks like. And so here we go, our y equals 4 minus x squared. Our y equals x. And our x equals 0. All right, so let's, we'll go ahead and see what this looks like. So it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, out to up to oh boy and so on and so forth and what do we want we want here 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 and to do that, we need to set up a definite integral, right, where we scan the region either from left to right or from bottom to top. As you consider the orientation of your rectangle, we're looking for the path of least resistance. Can I do this with the fewest definite integrals possible? So in this case, does it make sense to scan the region from left to right with vertically oriented rectangles, or rather scan the region from bottom to top with horizontally oriented rectangles, and why? Tyler? What's that? Vertical. Vertical, I'm down too. So I'm going to go with a vertically oriented rectangle because then, regardless of where we draw it, we're still bounded by the same term, uh, curve on top and the same curve on bottom. As opposed to horizontally oriented rectangles, they'd switch boundary curves midway, right, through your scan from bottom to top. You'd switch to the right side boundary curve. And that would require two definite angles. Okay? All right, so what are we going to do? Well, we need to find this point of intersection so I can get the limits. All right, the limits <coughs> on my um, definite integral. And so I'll go ahead and use my graphing calculator now to get the coordinates of that point. And I saw some discussion. It looked like different people were getting different results when you were finding that. So let's go ahead and see. I'm going to do 4 minus x squared. And I'm going to do y equals x. And I'm going to make my window match as best as I can. So I'll go negative 1 to 3 and negative 1 to 5. All right, so there's our picture. And how do we do? OK, we did all right. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can't pin down that point of intersection. Second, calculate 5, intersect. First curve, enter. Second curve, enter. Guess, enter. Looks like 1.561, etc. All right, so that's what I'll go ahead and use. And I'll store that in my home screen. So 1.56155. And I know you guys wrote it down. So 1.56155. Okay. Awesome. Now we can go ahead and set up our definite integral. Our definite integral will allow us to calculate right, the area of that region numerically. So I know my area of region R will be given by the integral from leftmost rectangle 0 to, uh oh, I better do A. Because we just defined A. of top curve minus bottom curve with respect to x. My top curve was the 4 minus x squared minus my bottom curve was the y equals x. 
And so we're going to integrate 4 minus x squared minus x from 0 to a and see what we get for our decimal approximation. Love math 9. So we got math 9 from 0 to alpha a of top curve 4 minus x squared minus bottom curve x. Yes, with respect to x, survey says about 3.758. Raise your hand if you have the same thing, about 3.758. Yes. Area, easy cheesy. Go go And I just want to encourage you, don't round to three here at your limits and points of intersection. Save it, store it, and then just round here to ensure that you're going to be accurate to that third place past the decimal to make sure you get your answer point, right? You can do all the calculus, you want to make sure you don't lose your answer point just because of a rounding issue or an accuracy or precision. Awesome. All right, so what's up with volume? Well, with volume, right, we're going to consider the, uh, the cross-sectional slice in what shape, right, that gives us for a cross-sectional slice and see if we can't write that area of a cross-section as a formula, change that to a function of one variable, and then integrate right across the range of possible cross-sectional slices. For that, I think I want to grab this and bring it over here. It looks silly when I was saving it, so I'm going to go ahead and do it here. All right, so what's up now? Well, I'm going to take my same region, right, my same region, but now I'm going to spin it about the horizontal line y equals 5, and so let's consider what that's going to look like. Well, if I spin that about y equals 5, and consider the shape of the results, it looks like we've got Let's revolve that about the horizontal line y equals 5 and consider the bunt cake, the results. <laughs> like we've got the volcano project, right? In elementary school, I did that volcano project once, you know, that one year. Thwack, perpendicular to my axis of rotation, pull out a typical cross section, and what do we have? Well, it looks like we've got. Look like we have the washers here. So I just wrecked my picture. I had a great picture going on, and then I wrecked it. <laughs> but a typical cross section appears to be the shape of a washer. And I can write the general form for the area of my typical cross sectional slice given by pi r squared minus pi r squared. And let's get some little radius in there. And some outer radius. All right. And write that now as a function of one variable. So I'll rewrite my area function and I'll call it a of x. So my a of x is given by pi r squared, where my first radius is the little red radius. It looks like that catches the lower curve. So which one is that? Uh oh. That's not going to work. I'm sorry to talk about that. I know. I need to connect my axis of rotation to the original region, and that's why I shaded it with that green, right, pepper shading, so that it reminded me to draw these line segments connecting the axis of rotation to the original boundary curve, so that I'm not, this is some ghost curve, right? This is some ghost curve that was just created as part of our sketch to visualize. We need to connect the axis of the rotation to the original boundary curve because I have an equation for that. Yes? Okay. Good catch, Mr. Fritz. That was close. So what are we going to do? 
Well, the same thing we were going to do before. We'll keep that vertical distance positive by doing y equals top curve minus bottom curve. So this red, sorry, the black outer radius is going to be y equals 5 minus y equals x. Is that right? 5 minus x? 5 minus x? Yes! So we'll go ahead and do 5 minus x quantity squared minus pi and then, uh oh. I little r squared bless you. So my little radius is top curve minus bottom curve. And that was the red line segment. And that was 5 minus, oh gosh. Now that's the 4 minus x squared. Yikes. That's not good. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's all right. It'll be OK. Maybe. Maybe it's going to be OK. We need uh, 4 minus x squared in parentheses. All right, so we got everything. We got it all. Awesome. Let's find our volume. So I know my volume of the space shape will be given by the integral, right, from A to B of my area of a typical cross section function, regardless of where I take that slice, with respect to x. Okay, so for us, we're going to do the limits 0 to squared alpha a of my a of x that I just defined with respect to x and see what we get on the emulator. So here we go. We're going to do math 9 it. I'm going to put the pi out front uh, and do it all in one shot because I'm feeling, feeling brave today. 0 to a alpha a and, oh boy. So I want 5 minus x in parentheses squared. So I'm going to do parentheses 5 minus x squared. Nope. 5 minus x squared. Huh? Minus. Uh oh. Oh no. Goodness. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. I'm going to work with that. Is that good? Oh, woo, Jiminy. minus, now I want five minus, oh boy, <laughs> we'll try, so that's been fun, yeah. trying to work out my syntax on the emulator pretty print. <laughs> Let's see what you guys got. Did anybody get 69.614? Hey, we both got it. Then it must be right, right? Well, it's a first check, but I'm going to take it. So I'm going about 69.614. Awesome. Great job, you guys. All right. So what questions do you guys have about our area and volume? review from last time. Now, please note, you will be expected to find volumes not just of solids of revolution, but also the described solid, right? The weird paperweight type thing where you've got a static base, right? And then a known cross section, whether you're told it's the shape of a equilateral triangle or a semicircle or something like that. You'll still be expected to do that. We used to do it all for All right, let's go ahead and pause the recording and take care of our OTL number four check. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so how do we find lengths in general? That is, right, how do we find distances? Well, what's the length of the segment that connects the two points negative 4, comma 1, and 5, comma negative 3, right? How could we do that? Well, we did that, gosh, back since geometry. If we consider the point negative 4, comma 1, and the point 5 comma negative 3. Go ahead and describe how you would find the distance between those two things, right? What would you do to find the distance between those two things? Riley? You take, like, find how far they are apart x and how far they are apart y, and then you 
Absolutely. We could utilize the Pythagorean theorem. So if we consider how far apart they are in terms of their x coordinates, right, shown in dashed red, and how far they are apart in terms of their y coordinates, the difference in their y coordinates, then we can do the Pythagorean theorem utilizing a squared plus b squared equals c squared to determine their straight line distance. And we're not even going to try. That's a long stretch there, Shooter. I'm going to go ahead and use a line tool for that, I think. That's safer. There we go. All right. So it looks like something like that. All right. So let's go ahead and do it. I know that the length of the line segment connecting those would give, be given by the square root of the difference between the x coordinates squared plus the difference between the y coordinates squared. For us, that looks like mm, 5 minus the negative 4. Uh, and my difference between the y coordinates appears to be negative 3 minus 1. And so Pythagorean theorem looks like 9 squared is 81 plus negative 4 quantity squared is 16. I'm going to need the square root of 97 units, yes? And we know that that would be a little bit less than 10. So 9 point something, right? 9 point high something. Cool. All right. What if we're talking about a curved length? How can we find the arc length of a delineated um, arc of a circle? So how long is the arc connecting the key points root 3 over 2, comma 1 half? Or wait, where's that? So root 3 over 2, comma 1 half would be, oh, yes, that would be our, our point our, that's on the terminal, uh, the terminal part of our special point, pi over 6. Right after pi over 6 radians of rotation on our inner circle. And negative root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. So that would be right here. Okay. Great. So how would we find not the straight line distance, but rather the curved distance here? So how do we find that red, right, that red curved line? Sophia? Oh, right. So if you found the corresponding central angle measure of that arc, we could take the portion of the whole circle and the whole perimeter that that arc represents in order to get the length of the arc on the outside. That sounds great. And so what special radian rotation corresponds to this? Well, this is after pi over 6 radians of rotation. This is after 5 pi over 6 radians of rotation. Which means the portion of the circle that we're looking at is 5 pi over 6, take away 1 pi over 6, is 4 pi over 6, or... Two pi over three radians. Out of how many radians in total? Well, in a unit circle, there's two pi radians, and so what we're dealing with is what portion of the whole. We're dealing with two pi over three out of the entire two pi, which is how much of that circle? How much is it? What portion? That is one third. So we're just dealing with a third of the circle. If we're dealing with a third of the circle, right, represented, then that arc must be a third of the entire the entire circumference. And so we get the entire circumference from our unit circle by doing the entire circle is given by. <laughs> uh oh, look out! What mm -hmm. that is. 2 pi r, in this case, the unit circle. So isn't that just 2 pi units? Yes, 2 pi units. And we want a third of that. 
looks like we're right back where it started. So it looks like that arc length is given by 2 pi over 3 units. Gosh! Okay. Danny. Are the unit circle is the arc length always going to be the same as like the angle? Let's see. What's the circumference of the unit circle? No matter what, it's always going to be 2 pi. What is the radian measure of one full rotation? 2 pi. So since the radian measure of one full rotation is exactly the same as the circumference all the way around, then yes, the portion of the circle is always going to equal the arc length for, unis for the unit circle. Awesome. That's a nice little ancillary benefit of working with the unit circle. <laughs> All right, so we've got straight line segments. We've got arc length if we're dealing with the circle. So what about curved lengths of functions? That is, how long is the portion of the graph y equals cosine of x, say, on the interval from 0 to pi? Everybody, let's go ahead and get a nice little sketch of that so we can see what we're talking about. So let's consider the graph of y equals cosine of x. We know my cosine of x, let's see if I did pi over 2. Pi, pi over 2, um, negative pi over 2. So let's go ahead and get a nice picture. I know that the cosine of 0 is 1. Uh, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. zero. Oh, you guys are awesome. Pi, comma, negative 1, thanks. And then. All right, so if we consider the graph of cosine of x, right, we know that I think Mr. Prince, that's pretty good. You know, I'm practicing, we're talking about from here to here. That red segment, right, how long is that? Well, are those, right, are these, um, is this arch part of a circle? No, is it part of a parabola? No, right, this, this, <laughs> the arch of a sine graph is not parabolic in nature, right, that would be a power function, this is trigonometric, and so it's not a parabola either, and so do we have a regular geometric formula the way we did for a circular arc length? No. All right, so what we're going to do today is find a way using calculus in order to determine that curved length of a function, right? Not just when we're dealing with some geometric formula or quantity that we already know. And so we'll be able to find that red arc length today using calculus, and that's our job. So what's up? We're going to find the length of a curve, and we're going to do it in our cooperative learning groups. My name is Brendan. So let's go ahead. <laughs> Hit circle our saved algebra items 3B, 6, 13, 17. I'll put them on the sideboard as well. I'll pause the recording and then we'll resume after we've generated your last stamp. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's go ahead and solidify our new learning for the day. In order to find the exact length of a curve given by y equals f of x over an interval. a to b, using a definite integral, the function must be blank. Well, that was one of your non-stamped items, but I made reference to a very, very important theorem. In fact, one that allowed us to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus earlier. But in order for us to use a definite integral, the function itself must be blank. Secondly, the length L, described above, is given by the definite integral that Tyler is going to commit to memory. And that will be generalized with S and A's and B's, okay? With function notation with A's and with B's. Awesome. I'm going to give you guys just a minute to do that, and then I'm going to call on you to share. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in order to find the exact length of our curve, right, along the function y equals f of x over that interval A to B, what has to be true of the function on that interval A to B? What has to be true? Marissa? Um, continuous and differentiable. Absolutely. We have to have a continuous differentiable function along that curve.
Awesome. The length L described above is given by the definite integral with function notation in A's and B's. What does that look like, Courtney? The integral of A to B is the square root of 1 plus 2 times the square root of 3 squared. Absolutely. So we can find the exact length L along that curve shaped graph by integrating from A to B the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared, closed radical with respect to x. And raise your hand if you have the same formula. That's what we need to use and commit to memory. Nice job, you guys. Way to go. All right, so the rest of the time then will be yours. I'm going to go ahead and save the recording and upload to our Moodle site.